of the mighty Tennessee down there, and the Colorado, waiting for their orders to sail as part of the great fleet under the command of Admiral R.H. Lay, in charge of the battle fleet. Nine dreadnoughts and 56 other ships, including the airplane carrier Lexington, packed to the gunnels with a collection of deadly eagles, and they certainly look ready for business, whatever it may be. The fleet has secret orders to meet somewhere in the Pacific to take part in the maneuvers off Hawaii. And the whole country is buzzing with the rumors about where they're really going. Somehow, these magnificent saddle wagons always give you a thrill just to look at them. The California, the proud flagship of the Pacific fleet, ready to give a good account of herself. And here's the West Virginia, another tough-looking custom. And the Colorado. Well, wherever you're going, happy landing. And in the meantime, up in San Francisco, the crack 30th Infantry are on their way as parts of the Blue Army. They'll try to make a landing with the help of the fleet and capture Hawaii, the main object of the maneuver. Whether they stop there or meander over around the activities at Shanghai remains to be seen. Traveling with the Doughboys, are the 76th Field Artillery, another fighting outfit, a little reminiscent of similar scenes 15 years ago. Friends and relatives are smiling, but a little panicky as she swings out off on the big adventure. The Pacific Ocean's not very kind to Uncle Sam's battle fleet, but the great waves make an exciting picture as the giant warships bite right into them and shake them off. It's one of the toughest storms they've ever met, and it's a miracle that there weren't any serious accidents to the sailors whose duties called them to the decks. This is the Blue attacking force on their way to recapture Oahu, which the Black Army is supposed to have taken. The greatest peacetime men over in the history of the country. Some naval experts say that the problem actually was to see if the present land forces could take care of themselves in case of invasion by an enemy fleet. Every branch of both services is represented. Airplanes from the carriers Lexington and Saratoga are all set to do their stuff. The fleet is nearing the islands after four days at sea, and it's up to the aviators to bring back information about the blacks. The planes have discovered the defenders. They've done a lot of snooping around and found out about the enemy's strength. And after reporting to the fleet, they get busy with the smoke screens to fill the air to cover the landing parties of Marines and soldiers. They're as enthusiastic as though it were a real war. That's one reason. And another is that they're happy to be ashore again after a four-day battle with old Neptune. Even soldiers can get seasick, you know. Both sides claim the victory. The Blues, because they landed their troops. And the Blacks, because they claim they'd have annihilated the whole crowd if they'd been using real ammunition. And satisfied with the important part they played, the Eagles go back to their nest, proving the value of airplanes at sea. A modern touch to an ancient weapon. Well, it was a great war. Too bad all wars aren't just like that. Nobody has the slightest suspicion of what's going to happen as the great ship slowly noses out of the dock. The crew is handling her carefully. These dirigibles are regular prima donnas with plenty of temperament. And today a committee of congressmen is on hand, all ready to take a trial flight. You see, there's been rumors that the Akron didn't quite come up to government specifications. Suddenly, a 50-mile gust of wind hits the monster. Her snubbing cable snaps like cotton thread. The $6 million ship swings around at the mercy of the wind. Another gale hits her, and she smacks to the ground in a crash that we cannot show you. The great stabilizer fin is in bad shape, and it's possible her metal framework's damaged. And just today, when they wanted to show her off for the boys from Washington, are they embarrassed? <laughs> 